Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Twas the last game before Christmas and all through the rink. I'm Dan, he's Matt. We're here to tell you what we think. Well, Matt, it's our last uh, new show of 2019. We've got a special for everyone next week, which we'll talk about. But it's been a weird week for the Flames right now. As After everything settled and they leave Minnesota, the Flames are eighth in the second wildcard spot in the West. Um, overall thoughts on this week before we dive into the games? I thought they had a poor game to start off with. An uh, okay game against Montreal and a good game against Dallas and then the wheels fell off the wagon against Minnesota. So an up and down week. Well, let's dive into these. You mentioned um, the Pittsburgh game, and I think this was a game that a lot of people weren't sure what to expect from the Calgary Flames. The Pittsburgh Penguins uh, were here in the in the Saddle Dome, and uh, they got the better of the Flames with a four to one win. Um, we saw only one Flames goal in this one from Johnny Goudreau. Overall thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, the Flames against Carolina in the last game last week, they played very good in the first period, weren't rewarded, and then just stopped playing at that point. And it was like watching that game on repeat, except for the fact that they scored the first goal in the first period. And then it's like, okay, we did awesome in that period. Good game, guys. And then they left the building, and Pittsburgh's like, hey, there's still two periods to play. And, yeah, that's basically... <laughs> how it went unfortunately for the flames i was glad to see cam talbot net in this one but i agree with you the flames seemed to come out hard uh get get going and then they just fizzled off in the second and third i wouldn't even say in this one the pittsburgh applied that much more pressure in the second and third it's just that the flames i don't know stopped playing yeah and it's frustrating because of the fact that this game was very winnable i did not think that the Penguins were particularly good in this game. It's just that they showed up in the last two periods, which was something that the Flames did not do. Anything else with that one you want to cover? Uh, not really. Like it, It's going to be a repetitive theme this week, <laughs> so might as well just carry on to the next one. Well, let's jump into the next game, which was also at the Saddle Dome. The Calgary Flames uh, finished the homestand that they had going on. It was uh, a short homestand, only, well, four games, Toronto, Carolina, Pittsburgh, and Montreal. And they finished the homestand against the Montreal Canadiens and ended up losing 4-3 to three to the Canadiens in OT. For this one, I thought the Flames came out looking really good, but they got outworked in the second period, and that's what caused... I think the the downfall for them for the rest of the game. Um, when you look at the two lineups here, the Flames had the better lineup. They just got outworked by the Canadian. Yeah, it, it, in repeat of the last game, they were awesome in the first period. Got up two nothing this time instead of just one nothing, and then stopped playing. Montreal came back. The Flames managed to get the lead again, gave that back, and then lost in overtime. And it was clear that Montreal wanted it more from that point forward. The Flames just came out in the first period. Hey, we're awesome. And then, okay, we're good. The Flames wore their retro whites for this game, and the third Flames goal came from Oliver Shillington getting his first of the year. Yeah, nice to see him getting on the board. It's so weird for me to see these two games where the Flames did really well in the first and then fizzled off because he's just the complete opposite. They look bad for the first and second, and they come back in the third and go, oh, okay, we should probably win this one now and end up winning it. So it's like we flipped the whole script. Yeah. Now, we need uh, what we need is basically the somebody who was one of our good coaches for the second period. I think it was Playfair who was really good in the second, have Ward do the first and have, like, Peters or Hartley do the third. And, Can you imagine you know. what that looks like? Head coach, first period. Head coach, second period. Head coach, third period. <laughs> Scrums are going to take us all night after that, Matt. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you, all the media people just break out in the teams. You know, some go to this guy, some go to that guy. If you have a first period <laughs> question, go over here. If you have a second period question, you're down that hallway. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you can do that. Can you have, like, 
head coach and then associate coach first period, associate coach second period, associate coach third period. Yeah. Uh, um, the Flames then w- went on a two-game road trip. Um, I guess technically not two games, three games, but there's a long Christmas break in the middle, so they're coming home. Uh, went to Dallas, and this had to be the best game of the week for the Flames, if not the best game probably of the month, I think, for the whole team if we look at it. And the Calgary Flames won 5-1 against the Stars, getting goals from Mangiapane, Kachuk, Monahan, Backlund, and Ryan. Yeah, the Flames just stomped the the Stars. There's, you know, it was a... This was probably the best effort that we've seen since before the All-Star break last season. They just completely embarrassed the Stars, and it was an excellent game to watch. Uh, They put on a passing clinic, especially on the power play. Those goals on the power play were just fantastic, and... It was complete domination, and it's nice to see. Um, Looking at some of the stats here, Flames got 30 shots on goals, won 53% of the faceoffs, uh, 15 hits, 23 block shots, and only eight giveaways. And like you said, there was a lot of good passing in this one. I think that really helped reduce that giveaway number as well. Yeah, and one of the things I really liked about the power play was usually like successful power plays generally you have to get the defenders moving to in order to create lanes in order to shoot and one of the problems from this season is that most of the guys are just more or less standing around and like the pass is in a static way and like even if the guy with the puck moves nobody else is really moving and it it's easy to defend against, and that's one of the reasons why the Flames' power play has been rather poor this season. Do you think it's and fair to say that the majority of their losses in the last couple of weeks, let's say since the uh, win streak came to an end, have really been because they haven't been able to capitalize on special teams? Well, a good portion of it. Like, if you look at, say, that Pittsburgh game, uh, it was only a one-goal game, even though it was a 4-1 final because two empty netters. Like if you get a power play goal at some point in that game, it's a win instead, or at least a point in overtime. And you know, and you can even go back into October and November. Just the lack of special team success has been a huge detriment to this team. And you know, if they can figure out how to get a more deadly power play like what we saw in the Dallas game and get it consistent, that'll pay a lot of dividends. Because you're not going to obviously do that every game, but if your percentage goes up where you're clicking more like 25% instead of like 15%, it makes a big difference. I think to me, instead of worrying about deadly, we just need consistent. Like you were saying, you know, the percentage needs to go up. It might not be the best power play in the league, or you see some teams that rock for 10 games and then, you know, their power play falls off. I think it just needs to be consistent. We need to get, you know, the power play scoring at, say, a 30, like you were saying, 25, 30% clip, and that's going to make the difference, especially in some of those tight games. Yeah, well, that was one of the reasons why the Flames were successful last season is that they had the fourth best power play in the league. Now we have the 24th best power play, and the Flames' offense is struggling significantly because of it. And vice versa. You also got to keep the puck out of the net when you're on the PK. Yeah, which the Flames have done an excellent job this year of that, but, you know, you want to have your both your power play and your penalty kill being effective and the one thing the flames have to work on i think like you said the pk is good but taking less penalties and we saw some of that this week as well um not so much in some of these later games but you know the flames are still i think taking way too many penalties yeah well when you have guys like lucic and kachuk and all that on the team you're gonna take some penalties well now that ben is back we'll probably take a few more stupid penalties yeah but there's a game this week where we took no penalties, believe it or not, and that was the last game, the game that was played today at 3 p.m. against the Minnesota Wild in Minnesota to end this small road trip. They wanted to get this game over and done with early so that they could get everyone home for Christmas. And uh, Devin Dubnik got a shutout. The win, the Wild got their first home win in five weeks against the Calgary Flames. They they won 3 nothing 
over the Flames with Cam Talbot and Nett. Um, to me, when I looked at this, the Flames just, they looked like they were in holiday mode. They didn't really come out wanting to play. Even in the first, I didn't think they did that great. Yeah, the, it, you mentioned the Flames didn't get any penalties in this game. Well, it's easy not to take any penalties when you do not actually put any effort in whatsoever. And, um, yeah, the Flames just, they weren't really competing very hard in this game whatsoever. And it's understandable, you know, when you're playing a night game in Dallas and then having to fly all the way across the country for the next morning to be there for an afternoon game, like, whoever did the NHL schedule was moronic for this one. Like, if, if it was, say, we were playing Arizona, which is rel or Vegas, which is relatively close to Dallas that would have been okay. But when you're flying all the way across the continent, you know, with that kind of a turnaround, like, that's just not fair to anybody. And especially with a, a night game followed by a day game. Like, it, like it's even hard for baseball players to, and they play every day, to deal with that kind of a turnaround. I and, like the idea of the early game to get these guys home for Christmas early, but... Yeah, you're right. It needed to be planned better. If you're going to make it a back-to-back, -back, go somewhere close to Dallas, like Vegas or somewhere somewhere close by. Yeah, and it's just unfortunate that the schedule makers didn't proofread like what they were actually putting together because any rational person would have went, like, that's not really fair to the Flames. And like I already had this one penciled in as a loss and a probable shutout just because how do you play like 14 15 hours after you just played on the other side of the continent like it's just not you know like the team probably didn't get into minnesota till two or three in the morning it you know and it does it's a take, tough scenario you know, to give you a chance to win yeah like it it would have been tough if it was like say we played here and then went up to edmonton or over to vancouver let alone you know over oh we're playing here and then tomorrow we're playing in toronto it's like uh okay i don't know the schedule makers but i have a feeling the thought was well we put them in minnesota they're closer to home for the break and it's like yeah but just getting there wasn't worth it yeah um so now the flames are three days off for christmas they take the 24th 25th 26th off and they'll be playing again on the 27th in edmonton and that's a quick road trip up there and then back home for two. So hopefully the break will do these guys some good. Looking at the week, though, and where the team is at after uh, maybe some games that they should have won here, they're now sitting at 43 points, which puts them in the second wild card spot in the Western Conference, uh, right, behind the, uh, right behind the Dallas Stars, I believe. Yeah. Um, and if we look at where they sit overall in the West, the Calgary Flames are eighth, 43 points. Edmonton's 44. Dallas is 44. Winnipeg's 44. Vegas, 46. Arizona, 46. Colorado, 47. St. Louis, 62. So as we've talked about last week, this this Western Conference still, it looks like it's finally starting to shape out the way it should be. The teams like Edmonton that shouldn't be doing well are starting to fall, but still really close. I mean, we're at 43 points. Arizona's third at 46. One more win and you're, you know, you're back at the top. So I think... It's it's going to be an interesting race here for the Flames from here on out. Yeah, like you know that like certain teams are just going to be near the, or at the basement, like L.A., Anaheim, Chicago, even Vancouver, Edmonton, Minnesota. Like those ones are ones that you can expect to remain poor. And you know Nashville should be better than what they are. San Jose sh certainly shouldn't be dead last in the west but you know it's tight but calgary should be able to bridge that gap it's just they have to show up for games and that's one of the things that they haven't been doing a lot of recently the effort levels just haven't been where they need to be and, you know, it, it is hard to play as often as this team does with the scheduling and, you know, the road trips and all that. Uh, it's kind of nice that the team will be back 
on Saldome Ice on the 29th, and they stay on Saldome Ice right through uh, January on the 2nd. They play the Rangers here, so it's not until the 5th that they're going to be on the road again. So hopefully some time at home with family over the holidays will be beneficial to these guys. Well, even then, the road trip, it's Minnesota-Chicago, which both of those are close together, then back here for a couple, and then the Eastern Canada road trip. So, like, it, even though they're on the road, like, it's not stupid travel, like, where you're traveling, playing a back-to-back on opposite sides of the continent. And the crazy uh, road trip scheduling that we saw earlier this season, they're done with that. Like, you know, they don't have, I think, a long, arduous road trip again. I'm just flipping through the schedule here. But, yeah, there's really no – I mean, the next hardest road trip is the end of February. Detroit, Boston, Nashville, Tampa Bay, and Florida. So Which, they, even then, they're all t- clustered together. Like, there's a New York, New York, and New Jersey trip. Like, it's the Eastern Canada trip. There's a California trip. Like, it, there's not really – anything stupid where you're like playing one game and then going up across the country or anything stupid like that it's pretty much like all the games for the rest of the way are clustered like even if they're on the road it's all together instead of you know playing pinball like it has been basically the entire season so hopefully that's going to make it a lot easier for the calgary flames to you know, get some momentum behind them and get some regularity to their schedule. I mean, you know, you and I would be frustrated. Anyone would be frustrated if we were traveling as much as this team was. Yeah, and it's just bizarre travel. Like, it, it's like they just threw the uh, whole schedule planning into a computer and hit randomize, and okay, that works, and... <laughs> Well, it's not just the Flames this year they're complaining either. I remember seeing some notes about the GM meeting that the NHL had, I want to say, early November, I think, was the last GM meeting. And for the first time, the GMs asked for the scheduling team to come and address why things were done because nobody had any ideas. So this year, obviously, more than usual, there's a lot of GMs unhappy with the schedule. Yeah, and... Like, I know in uh, Major League Baseball for the longest time, they actually had a couple who actually did the schedules out for each year by hand. You know, and... It's not a job I'd want. No, and literally they mapped it all out for all the teams, and they did it for like 60 years or something like that. It was just weird, but uh, yeah... Well, let's let's move on here with uh, away from some scheduling stuff. Unless there's anything else you want to chat about there, but I mean the schedule is what it is, and I think every team's got that one or two road trips. And there's always one team that complains about the road schedule caused them not to be in the playoffs, and I hope that's not going to be us. Yeah, well, thankfully, pretty much like other than uh, that one trip at the end of February or beginning of March. Like, there's not really too many road games. Like, there's a couple of, like, three-game road trips, a four-game road trip, but, you know, like, it's fairly, you know, like, there's no real, like, one- or two-game road trips here on out. Like, it's... If we're going on the road, we're going to be on the road for a little while. Yeah, which that's always a little bit easier, I find, because, like, especially when they plan it out properly, like when you're playing Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa, or New York, New York, New Jersey, or, you know, the California trip, or, you know, guys all in the Northeast, or, you know, stuff like that, where it's, you know, you're playing basically in the same neighborhood, that's fine. It's when you're, you know, pinballing that it's a little annoying. Yeah, and we're not doing that anymore, so that'll make things easier. I mean, the only time we have one-game trips, like the Edmonton trip, or uh, we have another one-game Edmonton trip, but they're short trips where if you wanted to, you could probably be back in your bed that night. Yeah, and at the end of March, the last road game of the season is against Vancouver, and it's in the it's right in the middle of six home games for the Flames. So, like, that's make not it a day a, trip. Yeah, like it's not a big deal. 
Well, Matt, the uh, thing we talked about last week that we weren't sure if he'd clear or not was Austin Zarnik on waivers, and Zarnik has cleared. I'm not surprised they clear to you. No, not at all. That's the thing. Like Most players that are on that fringe level, like even Jankowski and stuff like that, it, it, most teams have their version of that guy. And, you know, like, there's not... Like, unless you're running into a bunch of injuries right at that time where the waivers are a thing, then then that guy might get claimed well not otherwise. just not just injuries probably long-term injuries too because when you claim a guy from waivers you got to keep him on your nhl roster for the rest of the year yeah right so you wouldn't just want to pull him up because someone's hurt for a couple of weeks you'd want to pull him up because you got a bunch of guys hurt for two three four months yeah well you can waive that that guy again it's just that the team that had him has the first right of refusal yeah, how often do we ever see that, though? I think you're pretty much saying if we're going to take him, we're going to keep him. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not surprised Zarnik cleared. and I'm sure that like if the Flames have forward injury troubles, he'll be the first guy back up. And You know, cap-wise, yeah. I don't know if he will be. I think that there's other guys like Quine. I mean, there's a team that's you know bumping up on the cap that they might bring up just to save a few bucks here and there. Yeah, it could be. Or even a Matthew Phillips or someone else who needs a chance. I think they know what they've got in Austin Zarnick. They've given Austin Zarnick a chance. And I think now maybe it's time to see somebody else. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't expect Zarnick to be back next year. Is Zarnick's deal up at the end of this year? Yeah, it was a two-year deal. So, at, at over a million, yeah, I can't see him being back. I mean, he's we thought he was a little overpaid when they signed him last year. And now, you know, seeing him be, get sent to the farm, we're kind of admitting he's probably overpaid. So, yeah, I think that his days the Calgary Flame are probably numbered, unless he's willing to take a big pay cut. Yeah. Which I, I can't see him doing. No. And it is what it is. Well, with that, the Flames are now pretty much at their halfway point. It's usually that correspond to the end of the year, and at least halfway for us on the show. The Flames now played 39 games. They're 19, 15, and 5 with 43 points. So, you know, the 82-game season, we're pretty much there. And Matt, you and I always like to make predictions um, at the beginning of the season. Should we look back and see how our predictions are looking right now, halfway through? Well, I can tell you that they were pretty damn awful compared to what we were expecting uh, that's for sure so the first thing we predicted was who is going to have a breakout season and i said i had two names i said bennett and lucic you said bennett um, i'd say lucic is not breaking out and neither would i say for bennett lucic is looking better but it's not a breakout season for him yeah like he's not bouncing back to what he was prior to edmonton or his first year with the oilers it's we basically got the as advertised Milan Lucic, which is all right. And Sam Bennett seems to be, well, Sam Bennett. Like he's, he's as he was last year, he's as he was the year before. We're not seeing a lot of growth in his game yet. He's been out for a while, but even before that, I don't think we're seeing a lot of growth. Yeah, I think uh, the writing's getting on the wall that, you know, this is what he is, is a third, fourth line depth guy that's interchangeable. The next question, you are definitely getting right so far. Who will struggle this season? I said Andrew Mangiapane, and you said Mark Jankowski. Uh, we've seen Mangiapane skyrocket up the lineup here. I mean, you know, there's been nights he's playing on the second line. There's nights he's been bumped up to what you'd call the first line. So he's having a great season so far. But Jankowski, I mean, you and I have talked about should we be waving him. Yeah, and... If he wasn't doing so well on the penalty kill, I think that he wouldn't be here right now. He's been a healthy scratch a number of times this month. Yeah, and he has played better as of late as well. It's just he need if he wants to remain in, in the NHL, he has to play better than what he's been showing. We reflected on if we thought both goalies would be able to stay healthy, and we both said yes, and so far we've seen that. I mean, a few years ago we ran into some health troubles with Riddick, um, but so far both guys are healthy. We can debate if the rotation that they're going through is healthy or not, but both guys are at least healthy in terms of uh, you know, the NHL's official stats count. Yeah, and 
what do you think about this? Would you rather see Talbot get a few extra starts moving forward? Because to me, as of late, he seems to be playing really well where Riddick has kind of struggled a bit. Well, that's the next thing that we actually uh, predicted was how many starts Talbot will get. I said he'll get between 30 and 35. You thought he'd get 40. Right now at the halfway point, he's at 11. So if we keep going at the same pace, he's on pace for 22 starts, far less than we thought. I think you're right. I think Talbot's looked good. They need to give him a few more starts. But at the same time, generally you'd flip things around. You would have probably given Talbot more starts up front and Riddick down the stretch, especially if Talbot's only on a one-year. So I think the fact he's on a one-year is going to limit the starts from here on out. But I agree with you. He's looked good. I I think there's maybe only one game this year when I can say Talbot didn't look good. Um, But I think we definitely need to start evening out that workload a little bit. Yeah. The goalies are getting paid exactly the same. I'm not saying they should play exactly the same, but I think early on we were riding David Riddick because we were trying to get out of a hole. And now I think we need to split that workload up a little bit better. Yeah. And honestly, Jeff Ward seems to be doing that better than we were seeing with Bill Peters. But I, I think right now, looking at where our predictions were, he Talbot, I think he could get to 30. Right now, I don't think he's getting to 40. Yeah, I mean, that I don't means he's either. playing pretty much every game from here on out. Yeah, that would be like if Riddick got hurt and, you know, it was basically Gillies or... Uh, Zagadulin. Zagadulin, yeah. The next question is, who would be the first call-up? We picked a forward and a defenseman, each of us. Uh, you picked Dylan Dubé and Oliver Shillington. Oliver Shillington was the first defensive call-up. He got called up on October 22nd, so you were right there. Dylan Dubé got called up on November 17th. My pick was Alan Quine and Oliver Shillington, and Quine was the first call-up of any kind this season on the 20th of October. And then Shillington came after him. So, uh, as usual with our games, I'm beating you there. I got Quine and Shillington. I mean, you could say Dylan Dubé is the, I guess, the better call-up because he's stuck. But Quine was still the first call-up. Yep. Uh, First guy to be traded. I thought Jankowski. You thought Froelich. Both names have been circulating around with rumors so far this season. But... As of now, going into the the NHL roster freeze for the holidays, both guys are still Calgary Flames. Yep. When we asked what did the Flames need to do to be successful, I said the Western Conference Finals. You said Stanley Cup Finals are bust. Um, still thinking we're going to be Stanley Cup finalists, Matt? Well, it, this a- team and... They say you know, it, as, it, if you're in the dance, it, you can it, win the Cup. Well, the the thing is, is that situationally, the Pacific Division is really shit. <laughs> like, there are... Every team is bad right now. Like, Arizona's leading. Vegas is not very good. Edmonton's horrible. Uh, Vancouver and the California teams are not very good. So, like, if you can, you know, get your stuff together enough where you know you're just competent you should be able to make it to the conference finals just based off of that just because you're playing other teams from the same lousy division you should be able to get to the conference finals yeah but so far a lot of the teams in our conference are doing better than us yeah well and that's the thing if they show and up even in our division I know, and that's but the you can problem. say the same thing about the Calgary Flames, right? I mean, so far this season, this team has not shown up. Yeah, and that's like if they play like they did against Dallas, which we know they have that in them because they did that for over half of the season last year. If they play like that, they should be able to do a okay. It's just for whatever reason they're tripping themselves up and. Yeah, it's kind of stupid. So, we'll see. I, I'm... i If they show up, they could have a lot of success. That's it's like when you tell if, us we'll make the trade if the deal's there, right? Like, of course they can have success if they show up, but so far this season they're telling us, well, we can't show up on a regular basis. Yeah, and if, like, what we're seeing from this team is what we get, I honestly don't know if this team even makes the playoffs. 
That's a that's a worry. Yeah. And like I, I yeah, I could easily see this team falling out of the playoff picture if they don't turn it around. Like these games this past week, frankly, three of the four were easily winnable and they just gave them away. Like two of them anyway. And well, skip like, yeah, you're you're right. They're they're uh, they're giving these games away. They're not they're not playing like the team last year. And there's been very little change to this roster. If you look at it overall, there's very little change to the roster, very little change to the personnel. But this is the team that was first in the West last year, and now they're you know barely hanging on to a wild card spot. And you you have to be thinking, what's changed? Yeah, because like all you've done really with this roster is swapped out a bad like the worst backup goaltender in the NHL and Mike Smith for a guy that's actually playing reasonably well. And one of the worst forwards in the league in James Neal for a guy who's playing that role better. So like intrinsically the problem areas have gotten better and yet the whole team has collapsed in on itself. And it's just frustrating to see because uh, like, if they weren't good, then, like, last season wouldn't have happened. Like, you don't get lucky and get 107 points. And, you know, like, you have to have a lot of skill there, and we're just not seeing a lot of players having anything even remotely close to an adequate season. It's a down year for a lot of guys. And there's been years in the past you and I have talked about the team and said, well, everybody had a bad season at the same time. That's why we didn't achieve the success we wanted. But And we can talk about this more in the new year based on what happens. But at some point, you can't keep blaming the coach or the bad years. At some point, they're going to have to look internally to this core and say, hey, what's happening? Yeah, and like that's uh, what, like in November when I was throwing out the red flag of like you know maybe this team needs to go through a complete roster shuffle you know it's frustrating because like this team there should be no reason why this team is where they're at frankly like they should be up with st louis right now based on how the talent is on this team and how they normally play it's just that like, within each game, there's not a consistent effort level. It almost feels and, like that first-round departure last year really shook this team to the core, and they haven't been able to sort of talk themselves back into how good they are. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, like, they need to just... And it's frustrating, because, like, you see how, like, the first periods that they played against Carolina, Pittsburgh, and Montreal, like, they were all over them. And you're like, okay, you can play like that. Great. And then they just vanish entirely. Like, okay, well, we got this game because we had a really good first period. And then the effort level's not there. And it's like, you need to have people on the bench going, you know, like if, like after the first couple of shifts in the second period, they play in like crap to like kick everybody in the ass to say, let's go, you know, like, we have to actually try to play here. You know, the other team's trying. We're not. Like, come on. Something. Yeah, but it happens over and over again, which tells you that there's something systemic in, in the yeah. makeup of this team. Yeah, and the hardest part always when you're rebuilding, like which the Flames have are out of the rebuild now, is getting everything to be that right mix of both talent and drive and like they have the talent it's just that for some reason the makeup of the players they're getting in their own way and they're tripping themselves up and it's just frustrating because you can see like there are flashes of brilliance to this team that like it's plainly obvious that there's a lot of talent in this well, organization. Well like that Dallas game shows that. You know, like, you, a, a crap team does not do what we did against Dallas. You know, they just, they can't make those kinds of passes with that many passes, with that regularity, 
and completely d destroy the other team. Like, you, an uh, untalented team just can't do that. It, it's just that the effort level and the consistency is just not there. And, like, when they're bad, they're absolutely horrible. And it's like, why are you guys in the NHL bad? Good teams it, are consistent, right? I think that's really what this boils down to is the best teams are consistent and can win – you know, a good game. It might not be their top game night in, night out, but the Calgary Flames are a roller coaster, and that's not a recipe for success. Is that kind of what this boils down to? Yeah. Like, you look at Boston. Like, they're always Boston and in terms of how they play. You know exactly what you're getting. Like, even when they missed the playoffs those couple of years and they did their little retool on the fly, they still were consistent in how they approached the game, even though the talent was kind of regressing there for a bit and then they shook things up and got some fresh blood in there but you know like you see teams like washington you know what you're gonna get pittsburgh you know what you're gonna get st louis you know what you're gonna get consistency yeah like they you might be able to beat them but it's not gonna be easy like even chicago when they were good you knew exactly what you were gonna expect from each game and you might beat them on the odd occasion, but it was not an easy game. And Calgary, on most nights, is an easy night. And like even if the Flames win the game, a lot of the times, like the other team's in it right until the end. Usually, when the Flames pull it out of the fire at the last minute, <laughs> and like it, this team's just frustrating to no end because of the fact that. They're squandering the talent they have, and it, it there's not a lot of easy solutions to fixing this problem. They, they have an identity, but they're not playing the way they need to every night, and every night you're coming in, you're seeing a different Flames team, and that's what this comes down mm -hmm. to. We'll skip some of these other uh, predictions here about the playoffs. We'll save those for the end of the year. But the, the other one that we'll go through here is Will Kachuk's performance match his pay as top flame. Yep. And we are both saying, you know, now that he's the top uh, paid flame, will he be the top performing flame? And if we look at the numbers now, he's played 38 games. He has 14 goals, 18 assists for 32 total points. The only guys even close, Monaghan, 30, Goudreau, 29, Lindholm 28 and then we drop all the way down to Derek Ryan at 19 so yeah I'd say that really when you look at the Flames this year and the guy who's been consistent which what you're just talking about Matthew Kachuk I would say is the flame that for let's say 90% of the season has come out looking ready to play and has been ready to win the games for the for the Flames yep I agree he's been my first half MVP of the team so you you really can't give that to anybody else, right? I mean, we've seen Monaghan struggle, even though he's got a lot of points. We've seen Goudreau struggle, but Chucky looks like he's always ready to go. Yeah, it would really be between him and Lindholm, because like even the defensemen have all looked poor at times. So like, there's not yeah, really I, I, there's I, not really. Any. I think Geo Geo's look good, but I think Geo looks like he's trying to do too much. He's trying to get the team out of a funk on, most nights on his own. Yeah. And, you know, you can't do that with one guy. But I think he's taking that role as captain and trying to, to do too much. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, as we move into 2020 and seeing where this team's at now versus where we may have expected this team to be going into 2020, any predictions you have for the second half of the season? Good, bad, or otherwise? Well, the Flames' schedule in the second half is significantly easier with no weird road trips or anything like that, it it's a fairly consistent schedule. Like, there's not really any bizarre weirdness, and the Flames are basically playing mostly mediocre teams the rest of the season. Like, it, you pretty much have to go to the end of uh, February and into the beginning of March before the Flames play a, a series of games against good teams. So... They should, if they get their stuff together, they should be running over most teams each night. It's just, is this team going to show up? And honestly, I don't know. Uh, like, uh, if what we've seen to this point is what we get, 
then honestly, I don't see this team making the playoffs. And if they, but do you have any, do you have any reason to believe that what we've seen so far is going to change the second half? Uh, well, they played better under Ward, so that's the only thing that, like, they're eight two and one since he got hired, and eight three and one. Pardon me, and you know that's obviously a lot better. We'll see. Like, it, it's where if you were we put this off for like an extra three weeks we'd have a better idea. It's just that this team, like if they play consistently good or even just consistently, then they'll be fine. And they should rock it up just because of the fact that they're playing a lot of very poor teams over the next two months. It's just, you know, if they take things like, Oh, well this team sucks. Therefore we don't have to try after the first period, then they're going to have some problems. Yeah, I just looking at this team and what we've seen so far, I think I think we're going to make the playoffs. I think we're going to make a probably a wild card berth, but I think that this is not going to be a great season for the Flames based on the first half. Yeah. Or at least I don't want to say not a great season. I don't think it's going to live up to the expectations a lot of people had coming in based on the regular season success of last year. Yeah. Mind you, like, if the Flames finish second or third in our division and play, like, Arizona in the first round, that would be fine by me, but... You know, Matt, I think it's going to be another typical Flames year. We make the playoffs, we play the first round, we're out in the first round. Like, that seems to be the Flames' MO these days. Yeah, pretty much the Flames' MO since 1989, so yeah. Right, but I mean, when... Yeah, when was the last time that we... Only, that you and I, yeah. I mean, we, we talk about going deep. When was the last time you and I honestly probably thought this team would make it past the first round? Last year. Last year. Yeah, that was it. Right, and when before that? Against San Jose back in the 90s, like 95. Usually we're happy to just be in yeah. the playoffs. Like 95 against San Jose was the last time, and we threw that one away too. We were up 3-1 in the series and lost because awesome. And then, and then the year that we did well, which was 04, no one even expected us to to make it oh, past the first round. So everybody in the Saddle Dome was like, "Hey, we get to see playoff hockey, and you know, like maybe we might get one more game out of this before we're over." And <laughs> you know, like that's about it. Like nobody had any expectations of beating Vancouver, and that let alone Detroit or San Jose, like or pushing Tampa to the seventh game, like. That that was like uh, okay, sure, this happened, and you know, like certainly didn't have any expectations at that point, and so you know, I mean, I I I thought we'd get better coming into the season, but looking at where we are now, I think we're gonna probably see a one and done again. Yeah, I could see that. It it would depend on who our first round matchup is. Like if we're playing Edmonton or Vegas in the first round, I think the Flames are done. Uh, if we play Arizona, I think we take them. Yeah, but we thought we could take Colorado last year, too. Yeah, well... Uh, right? I mean, it's the same core. Like, again, what has changed enough that you think the results will be different? True. Like, it, you know, this team... Right? Take, taking the Flames fan out of us, what has changed enough that we were worse in the in the regular season, but we're going to be better in the playoffs? Yeah, like frankly, you know, taking the Flames fan out of it, uh, frankly, there's only two teams that I think will come out of the West, and that'll be either St. Louis or Colorado. I think every other team is flawed to some extent. Calgary, the only team from our division, frankly, that I think could go all the way is the flames and that's only if they get their stuff together and because they do have the most talent in our division that if they're actually clicking on all cylinders our division isn't very good so they would have an easy road to the conference finals and you know the other team might be beat up because the central is a bit of a <laughs> a dog fight really but you know because like whoever is in the second round it's likely going to be st louis versus colorado in the second round that's going to be you know they're that's going to be a war frankly 
But for Calgary to get to that point, it's going to be a war too. Oh yeah, but not to the same extent. Like it, it'll be tough, but it's not as physically demanding as. But as you said, a flawed team going in, there's already flaws that they're going to have to account for. I think. I think you know just because Calgary's going against a team that's more beat up doesn't mean that they've got a huge advantage. Yeah, but we've seen in the past that the less beat up team can tend to surprise in the conference finals. So that's where that would be literally the only way I could see the Flames beating either St. Louis or Colorado if they got to the conference finals is if the other teams just beat up and the Flames are fresher. But I don't even see that happening, frankly. Like at, at this point, like call me back, like at the trade deadline when we have a better idea of what this team is, because like it, we're still too fresh off of the coaching change to really see like how much of the first couple months was Peters being an idiot with how he was. Well, and how much of this new stuff is the honeymoon period for a new coach yeah. versus you know the the team actually changing something? Yeah. Like, it, we don't know, like, how much of, you know, was the first two months what this team is, actually, or, you know, was it they were being hinders by Peters and with his shenanigans, and the team gave up on him. We don't know. And, you know, I mean, you, you've you said, you know, this team's looking better under Ward, and they definitely have, but I also wonder, how much is Jeff Ward, and how much is it, would the team have started to look better either way? Yeah, and... That's what the main problem is, is, that we're just a little too early for that. Just because of the fact that it's only been like three weeks since the coaching change, and it's not enough to completely figure things out. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think the Eastern Conference, uh, it'll be either the Capitals or the Bruins in the conference finals i don't see like most of the other teams in the east are kind of mediocre too like a, it's a lot of flawed teams there too we asked as we do every week our fans to send us some questions or things they want us to talk about and we had john wallace howell on twitter ask us i thought a really or sorry on facebook ask us a, what i thought was a really interesting question favorite flames game or games of the decade and he says for him it's that playoff series where we beat the canucks Matt, I'll open this up as well, not just games, but any moments. Maybe there's something else that happened with the team. Maybe it's a jersey unveil or some other thing um, of this decade. But what's your? what are your favorite games of this decade? Um, hmm. Well, game six against Vancouver was a lot of fun being in the building, especially when the Flames went down 3 nothing and won. Uh, I think if you look at it, like favorite can mean a lot of things too. Is it the... Your favorite as a fan, because like you said, you were in the building. Is it a game that's monumental to the team? It's hard to pick those. Yeah, well, the problem with this decade for the Flames is that the Flames were kind of stagnant at the beginning part of it and like desperately needing to rebuild with a team that did not want to rebuild for a number of years. Then going through the rebuilding process... And now, fledglingly getting there now. Like, there's not really... Like, outside of, like, a Ginla's jersey retirement, like, there hasn't really been too many... Really... You stole mine. That's what I was going to say was sort of my memory of the decade. I think when we look back at this decade as a Flames fan, that Ginla retirement... Yeah, like... That's probably the most memorable part of this decade for the Flames. Yeah, like, there wasn't really any... Other than that Vancouver series, like, there hasn't really been any awesome moments as a Flames fan, like, because... I don't think there's much else you can pick besides that Vancouver series. Yeah, because, like, oh, we sucked for, like, five years, and then we lost in the first round, then we, you know, like, it, like there's just not really been... Like, last season was awesome during the regular season, only to fall completely on their face... Which kind of... But even last season, I don't think we can pick one or two really crucial games. I mean, when you have a successful season like that, every game is part of the win. Yeah, and like the whole season, though, is kind of tarnished because of how hard they fell on their face in the playoffs. That like It's like, oh, great, you had 107 points and you won one playoff game. Woo, great for you. 
you know, like, no, th this decade has been probably the single worst in the Fl Fra Flames franchise history. Because at, le at least in the early 90s, the Flames were still an awesome team until, like, they traded McKennis and Gilmore and then started selling everything off. And, like, it, it started well, and it just ended poorly. And, like, this je decade has been just poor, bad, horrible, slightly good, and then back to being horrible again. And, like, there's not because we're in that weird phase of like we don't even know what this team is and like how to really fix this team without like you know kind of blowing it up partially it's gonna be tough really because like this team's in a weird spot right now and it's not exactly easy to fix without you know unless they can fix it in the room themselves it, it, Which then they've proven they can't, or they would have already. Yeah, like it, it's it'll be interesting to see. Like this team needs to grow up a little bit more, and th th this is one of those things that a lot of young teams have, and this team is still rather young. That you know, learning. You know, it's one thing to be able to learn how to win in the regular season. It's another to learn how to win in the playoffs, and like this team just hasn't got the right mix yet and we're getting there it's just we're gonna need another season or two yeah hopefully the next decade will be much better than this one yeah and like we need to see like if got certain players can step up and take their game to the next level like Hannafin. and you know like there's just a lot of questions really about this team and some seeds have been planted but we're gonna need a few more years i think to see everything come to fruition or not yeah and like i like a lot of the flames up and coming prospects like i'm really looking forward to peltier when he gets here uh because i think he's gonna be a fun player for this team and did you say the same thing about jankowski yeah but jankowski is he he's effective but, you know, as a penalty killer, I just don't know where his offensive game has gone this year. Like, he's been an effective player the last couple of years and looking like the heir apparent for Backlund up until this season and then just the offense went away. And, yeah, it's just like Colborn, his season with Colorado where it, he scored a hat-trick his first game of the season and then that was it. So, like, it was, it you know he's kind of vanished and I don't know if he's got much left in the tank, but Peltier seems to be a Brad Marchand type guy. And that will Peltier will be a question for the next decade for the Flames. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him in the lineup and he, I firmly believe he will get here. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, there's lots of things that are interesting for this team moving forward. And the scouting staff seems to, have a knack for getting good players later in the draft, which is also helpful. So, you know, this team's gonna need some retooling a bit and mixing things up for the next decade to get some success, but we'll see. Like, this, the the one good thing for the Flames is that our division is kind of terrible, and none of the teams that are in our division seem to be getting any better anytime soon. So the Flames should consistently be a playoff team just because of the fact that they're there. Uh, you know, where like a lot of... But at some point we need to be more than a playoff team. Yeah. We to push past round one. Yeah, and that that's where like the Flames need to learn. It's sort of like the 80s where they had to learn how to beat the Oilers. And like I think that like for the Flames they have to learn how to beat anybody, frankly and be able to beat different styles of teams in the postseason in order to take... I think the first thing they got to do is win four of every seven in the regular season. Yeah. Or as many of those series as you can, because then you're seeing different styles, like you said. You're getting on that winning track. Like, you know, we can look at certain points of the season where they've won that, but more often than not, they've been on the losing end of a seven-game series. Yeah, and thankfully, like, the second half of the season is, for the Flames is fairly easy for all intents and purposes like i know any team can beat any team on any given night but like right through the all-star break they're not really playing any 
playoff teams at all it, and like even afterwards they their first game back is against st louis then they're playing a bunch of non-playoff teams right until the end of the month when they play boston in a uh, two out of three games and tampa bay at the end of the month like it's not like january and february are very easy uh, march is fairly easy like yeah. they could be easy and, w- and we can talk about the schedules when we come back in the new year but that all-star break is what worries me because traditionally this team has done even worse after that break so while the schedule might look easy are they going to be ready to go yeah. and the last two years have shown us they aren't yeah. i know well but we can you know and that's it, it's one of those things that this team has made mistakes moving you know through the last handful of years and if they can correct them like St. Louis, they were effing terrible at this point last year. And, like, they couldn't get anything going. And they learned how, like, with the new coach, they learned how to win, and they were successful from that point forward, and they got out of their own way. And Calgary, like, if they learn from the things that were tripping them up and can get out of their own way, then you know they should be fine it's just uh, the evidence hasn't shown that will probably happen i know Uh, that's why it's always frustrating to be a flames fan (laughs) well let's move on we've talked about the last decade um let's close out this decade by letting everyone know that this will be the last show you hear with matt and i for 2019 uh we do have a show next week it's going to be me chatting with our friend in Stockton, Jeff Gregory, Stockton's finest. And we'll be going about 45 minutes in that one. And it's all about the Stockton heat, where they're at, players we should look at, etc. This will be our last new show of the year, which Matt brings us to our predictions as usual. We got more predictions than usual because it's our last game of the year. On the 27th, the Calgary Flames go to Edmonton for a one-game road trip. Then they come home for two, the 29th and the 31st against Vancouver and Chicago, respectively. Note the game on the 29th is a 7.30 start. Those ones are always weird to me and trip me up. Uh, Then they have the New York Rangers coming here on the 2nd of January. The 5th will be the Minnesota Wild, a 5 p.m. start. And you and I will be recording again on the 6th. So we have five games between now and when we record again. Um, Looking back at last week, neither of us did well. Uh, The... Predicting the Flames are going to win every game is not doing us much good. What do you think we're going to see from now until that 6th of January? I'm going to go with 5-0. and oh. Really? Yeah, I'm going to be bold. And all of the opponents are kind of mediocre. You even think they're going to win that first game after Christmas on the road, which historically they've done poorly with? If it was any other team than the Oilers, I would have probably said lose the first one, win the next four. But it is the Oilers. And like as long as you don't let McDavid have fun, you're you'll win. And yeah. You got to remember the Oilers have been ahead of us in the standings for most of the year. Yeah, I know cuz they had a absurdly good first little while, but they've been terrible for the last like 15 games and yeah, like they're 3 6 and 1 in their last 10. So like they're sliding. And Chicago and Vancouver are both near the basement in our conference. The New York Rangers are terrible and Minnesota, I think the Flames are going to want some revenge after today. So, you know, I think that this team should be able to go on a roll. Just because of the quality of the opponents, we're playing a lot of mediocre. And if they can have time to actually reset, like, you know, and like with the Dallas game, like they would, you know, if they can play like that and then like reset themselves and not having to worry about traveling to across the continent, you know, to play the next afternoon, this team should be fine. (laughs) I'm going to go, I was first thinking that, but I didn't know if I wanted to be that optimistic based on what we've seen the last couple of years. So I'm going to go three or the last couple of weeks, I should say, I'm going to go three and two. I think the flames will win their home games against Vancouver, Chicago, and New York. I think they'll drop that Edmonton game just because they traditionally do after Christmas. And I think they're going to drop the Minnesota game. I think they're going to want the revenge but I'm not sure that they're going to get what they want. So I'll say that they win at home and lose on the road this week. 
or these next couple weeks, I guess. Yeah. Well, Matt, that wraps it up for us for 2019. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. I hope all of our listeners have a happy holidays and we'll talk to everyone again in 2020. And as always, drink responsibly and drive safe because, you know, we want you to be here next year to listen to Dan and I rant more about the Flames. And to watch this team make their comeback, make the St. Louis approach and win the West. Works for me. We'll find out how the West was won in 2020. Matt, do you want to take us out the way you always do? As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.